welcome everyone to the Bent by Knowledge podcast, where we will dig into what current research and the Bible actually have to say about exercise and good nutrition. Welcome back, listeners. Today, we have here Dr. Kendan Fawcett, and today we're going to be talking about some barriers to healthy family eating behaviors. So Kendan, or Dr. Fawcett, uh, is the founder and president of Sticking Carrot Industries, LLC, a consulting firm specializing in the health and well-being of organizations and individuals. As a seasoned health educator, Kendan's experience includes developing, designing, and implementing health and wellness initiatives and worksite wellness programs. Kendan believes in giving individuals the tools to make small steps to take control of their health and wellness. And I got a sense of your website, and I love your website, so I would encourage everybody to go visit it. There's going to be a link in the show notes down at the bottom. Um, but her specialty areas include things like health and wellness education and training, behavior change, which is where a, a big part of what we'll talk about today, motivational interviewing and goal setting, executive coaching, wellness coaching, worksite wellness, managing health issues, nutrition and exercise consulting, and curriculum and program design, implementation and evaluation. Kendan holds an undergraduate degree in nutrition and exercise from Oklahoma State University. She received her master's in community health promotion and a PhD in behavioral health science from the University of Arkansas. She is currently completing an ISPP dietetic internship program through the Ohio State University. Her current research focuses on nutrition and behavioral change in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Kendan lives in central Arkansas with her husband, Anthony, three, kid, three kids, Mackenzie, who's 13, Tyler, who's 10, and Stone, which is, who is uh, 18 months. She enjoys being outdoors, lifting weights, hey girl, playing board games, and cooking when she isn't working. Welcome, Kendan. Thank Thanks you. so much for being here. So glad to be here. This is exciting. Yeah. Well, like I mentioned before, today we're going to be talking about barriers, and I love talking about barriers because I think to make any effective behavior change, you have to address the why behind you not wanting to make that change, which is basically a barrier. So the things that prevent you from doing anything, any behavior consistently. And so we're going to be talking about that specific to the family unit, which I'm really passionate about. Uh, I have a book coming out February 4th that talks about the um, family health behaviors with exercise and nutrition. And I firmly, firmly believe that almost any behavior that you have begins in the family home. You can think about anything. And so a lot of families are um, affected by barriers that prevent them from from doing these healthy behaviors. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Today, we're going to be addressing some of the main barriers. And then the next time that we talk, we're going to be talking about some practical ways to um, effectively get rid of those barriers so that you can then have healthier behaviors. So one of the top barriers I hear about is picky eaters that prevent the family from eating together. And I know you having three kids probably have a lot of experience with this. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, what mama made, everyone ate. And if you didn't like what she was cooking, you weren't going to eat that night. Now many families make multiple meals for their family. And although I can imagine it makes dinner time for picky eaters eat a little bit easier, and takes off the burden from mom's shoulders, I do feel like it might limit a few things and disturb some normal family dynamics and eating behaviors in a way. Like limiting the diversification of children's growing palates, and especially at really a really early age, like toddler years, teaching the children that what mom and dad are eating are what the family is eating to improve the dynamics and bonding of the family. Can you speak a little bit more about the barrier of picky eaters and eating the same meal regarding healthy family eating behaviors? 
Yeah, absolutely. And I have to laugh, Brittany, because growing up, we were the same way. Um, there wasn't, uh, well, I'll make this and I'll make this and you can just choose what you want. It was, I made this, you're going to eat it. Uh, you know, uh, I don't ever remember my mom even giving us the option of if you don't want what we're eating, you can have a bowl of cereal or you can make a sandwich. It was like, I made this, you're going to eat it. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say, I think we all grew up pretty okay. Um, but, you know, now that I have my own children and I've seen other families, um, specifically my sister has different eaters too, it, it can be rough. Um, so there's a lot of barriers that come with that. Sometimes you just have eaters that don't like certain foods. Um, you can always think of the big ones, vegetables, um, onions, garlic, all the good stuff that you want to cook with. You know, in the South, we call it the Trinity. So <laughs> any type of peppers or celery or anything like that. Um, so that can be an issue. And then also some of the barriers can be textures, taste, um, even the way foods look. So think about something that you really like that maybe doesn't look super appetizing. Um, you know, maybe it's chili because it's just kind of one color and kids don't really know what's in it. If they can't see it separate, maybe they don't want to try it. So that can be a barrier. Um, it can be difficult. You know, like I said, I have three kids. I have a 13 year old who is a very picky eater, a 10 year old, and he actually has Duchenne muscular dystrophy. That's why I'm so interested in that research. Um, and he's non-ambulatory. So we, we look at different ways to get his nutrition in without creating excess calories for him. And then I have an 18 month old who will eat everything if he's not throwing it on the floor. And then usually he throws it on the floor and then picks it up and eats it still. Uh -huh. um, you know, but I have to think, okay, what are some ways and what are things we can do to make everybody happy? And the barrier is a lot of times you can't. So, you know, next week we'll talk a little bit or next time we'll talk a little bit more about sneaking in some vegetables or some things like that. But it's difficult, you know, like I said, textures, taste, um, even peer pressure, what their friends are eating. I think that's a big one, especially as you get into adolescence. I don't know so much about boys, but I know girls, if their friends don't like it, they don't like it. Yeah, I do. And I think that's so interesting. One thing that when you were talking that I thought of is, um, I wonder how much early exposure to all of those foods affects um, how picky they are about it. Like for instance, I have a I have a friend too that was raised on a farm and he was raised by a single family or a single parent dad. And he said that his dad was big farm guy and he gave him meat probably earlier, much, much earlier than many kids. Like basically just gave him bacon right off the bat. And he had no problem eating much mostly any food because he was exposed to all that stuff. And I do see that. And I think we'll talk about a little bit later is that like, if mom and dad don't like it and if they don't present it to the kid, it's likely that the kid is not going to like it. So I wonder how much exposure to the food affects that. I don't know if you can talk on that a little bit. Yes. And actually um, it has been shown that earlier exposure does increase palate because number one, it just creates awareness and it creates, like you just said, acceptability. So if you see it on your plate every day, it becomes normal. I think it's, I don't know the exact number, 10 to 15 times trying a new food to actually decide if you truly don't like the food. Um, and palates do change. That is true. But for the most part, if you experience it from an early age and it becomes normal, just like everything else, you know, it's normal that you eat a vegetable at every meal. That becomes standard, that becomes practice, that becomes habit. Um, you know, one thing I will notice is, or one thing that you did say was watching the parents eat. If mom and dad are not eating broccoli and carrots and celery and all of the vegetables and their protein, and it's kind of that, oh, well, you need to do what I say, but not how I act. Mm. Of course, the kid's not going to eat that. If they see mom and dad eating Hardee's and Twinkies and Ho-Ho's, but then they're like, you should eat your broccoli. That doesn't really make sense. It doesn't add up. You know, in our brain, we're like, ah, that reasoning isn't, isn't right. right. So the so modeling is a huge thing. Modeling what you want your children to do and to, to act. And that goes with behavior as well. Yeah. And that's why I think the family unit is so important because y'all got to be in this together. Like we have to do it together as, as a big team. So, um, but in, in addition to picky eaters, I think that time is a huge, huge barrier. And we know this for almost every healthy behavior, time is probably the top barrier. Mm -hmm. And I think 
many families get really busy and have to stop for things like fast food or order takeout. They don't have enough time to prepare the food together because they put family nutrition sort of in the backseat. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about the time barrier to healthy family eating behaviors? Absolutely. You know, with anything, we all have the same amount of time. So we can use the excuse that time is a barrier and it is, it can be a difficulty. It can be something that has to be thought about or planned. So, you know, you're right. As families get larger and they get more busy, they have more things to do. What's the last thing that you want to do when you come home from a busy day? We've been working all day. We're tired. You know, let's say we did a great job and we made it to the gym. We, you know, picked everybody up. You get home. It's 6 30, 7 o'clock. The last thing you want to do is think, oh my gosh, what do I have to make for dinner? I'm guilty of it too. If I don't make a plan, sometimes I'm like, it's eight o'clock or it's usually not that late, <laughs> seven o'clock now with kids. You know, it's what are we going to have for dinner? So making a plan, I think is, is a great way to kind of, um, to work with that. We'll talk about that next time, Mm -hmm. but other than time, you know, some of the other barriers that come with time are not only the cooking the food, but the planning of getting your food, Mm -hmm. of preparing your food. So, you know, some things that families can do are just making schedules and plans and, and sort of developing a way or a system that works for them. Yeah. And I think you make a great point. I never thought about it like that because it isn't just the time to, to make the food. It is the time to travel to the grocery store, the time that you spend in the grocery store, the time that you travel back to your house that you have to count for. And it's funny because in, in fitness, I I say this all the time, time is a big thing with fitness too, because we say as a coach, you don't have an hour a day to spend exercising. And the thing is they may have an hour a day, but they, they may not have the 30 minutes it takes to get there, the 30 minutes it takes to shower and the 30 minutes it takes to get back to work or to the house. And so we do have to be understanding about that and account for that time barrier, just the way that we should account for it in this case. But there are some practical approaches and we'll definitely get into them like up to the, up to the elbows the next time we talk. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Some research also shows that lack of parental cooking skills is also a barrier to eating nutritious foods. Can you talk about the cooking skills barrier to healthy eating, uh, family healthy eating behaviors, and what skills are are required per se to eating a healthy diet, if there are any? Okay. um, Well, just first off, you know, it makes sense that if you don't have an idea of what to cook, how would you be able to? If you don't know what a healthy meal looks like, how can you even start to prepare it? So I think the first thing that we really need to think about is education. Mm -hmm. Do people understand what we're talking about? You know, um, you hear all these hype words, macros, and you hear words such as fasting, and you hear words such as, you know, timing, and when should I eat? What should I eat? And should I avoid food? So there's a lot of information, you know, a lot of chatter, if you will, of what you should be doing or what you shouldn't be doing. So I think the first thing is really just to focus on education and the correct education. You know, I see a lot of things on, on the internet, you know, and TikTok and, and things of these, these really good um, providers, dietitians, healthcare providers that are doing real stuff with people and like showing their real personality. I think you and I've talked about that before, Mm -hmm. but getting people to understand that it's, just practical things, you know, don't eliminate foods, don't um, do things that seem unusual to you, if that makes sense. Um, Like if eating just bacon and um, cabbage seems weird, probably because it is kind of weird, you know. (laughs) Um, so, so I think, like I said, the biggest thing is education. So when you're talking about macros, How many people really know what that means? So breaking it down to the level and the audience that you have. If you're talking to moms of toddlers, you're probably not going to try to teach them to make um, a filet and, you know, asparagus and (laughs) creamed potatoes. You're going to be like, okay, how about maybe instead of breaded chicken nuggets, we do naked chicken nuggets. How about we do, you know, boil a chicken and make a soup. Um, so things like that, I think are, are key and just, you know, there are resources out there. The USDA is offers some really good websites for, and some, some documents for 
um, eating like school aged kids and meals that you can make with things. Even, you know, during COVID times, a lot of parents are getting boxes of food for their kids that are virtual. And this is actually something I'm working with right now with Cabot Public Schools is what do these parents do with these boxes of food when they get it? Um, one of the issues was somebody got a sweet potato and they're like, what do I do with this? And they're like, well, you can make sweet potato fries. You can make, you know, just sweet potatoes, a little like Splenda and cinnamon and, and all those different things. So just the lack of education, I, I guess I just keep going back to that is you've got to meet people where they are and help them from that point. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it is something, I mean, I, I don't think that we understand how big this barrier actually is because there are so many parents that typically they're low socioeconomic, they're in a low socioeconomic bracket and they just didn't, weren't raised with cooking knowledge. And if I now have three, four kids to feed and I don't know how to cook, the easiest option for me is to go down the street to McDonald's and spend $10 on something that's already prepared. And so like you were saying, there's a bunch of free resources and we'll get into a bunch of these when the next time that we talk, but um, this is a huge barrier to get over, but it can be really, really simplified if they, they, um, they, they buy into those free resources mm -hmm. and they make cooking simple because cooking doesn't have to be hard. I mean, we have things like crock pot. You can just throw 20 ingredients into a crock pot and let it go. You don't have to do any cooking per se. So definitely something. Uh, but what about any skills that would be required? Do you think there are any required skills that you would need? Um, I think it kind of goes back to, back to the basics. You know, I was very fortunate to grow up. I grew up on a farm, but I also had a grandmother and a great grandmother that made everything from scratch. We had a garden. Mm. My dad raised beef cattle. Um, you know, so I learned to do all of those things from a very young age. So I think part of it comes back to learning small steps. You know, like I said, you're not going to go out and get the Julia Child's cookbook if you're just starting out. You're going to get, you know, cookbooks and crock pot meals for dummies. I mean, you know, we're going to start simple. So maybe it's like teaching your kids when you're doing things, small things, cutting up a carrot, cutting up celery, cutting up a potato, you know, sauteing a little meat and making a little soup. Um, you know, it, I think it's small things like just teaching them to be independent. And as a parent, you know, if you have to learn it for yourself, it's getting the skills and then working with your child to, to create that, like you said, that family dynamic. There's yeah. nothing that has been said that you can't learn to cook while you're teaching your kids to cook. Yeah. Um, yes. You know, if you mess up, you mess up. That's I always say like, I like to cook way more than I like to bake. Because cooking, I just kind of throw stuff in there and baking is more precise and it takes a little bit more. Industry. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and cooking, you're just kind of like put it all in there and, and mix it up. Um, but I think one of the things is just taking, and this comes back to time, taking the time to do some of those activities together, which again, bringing it back to the family unit, we should be doing that um, anyway. Yeah. You know, we should be taking time instead of watching 30 minutes on a show. How about we take 30 minutes and all like make something together? Yeah. And I love what you say about that because we, we talk about generational curses and the perpetuation of generational issue, issues. And if you know that your lack of cooking knowledge is because you weren't raised in an environment where you were taught to cook, why don't we reset that generational curse and say, like you just said, I'm learning while I'm teaching my kids and my kids are right there with me. I have a girlfriend that is, and she's no nutrition professional or anything like that, but she sends me pictures all the time of her daughter who has her own little tiny knife set and all this stuff. And she like cuts up it. her own fruit and all this, and they're, they do it together so that the, the child knows that this is a normal process. And they also gain skills that they can use later. So that way, when they get to college, we're not just eating ramen noodles and all this, <laughs> they're actually eating well. So I think I love that you said that. Yeah. Recent statistics also shows that about 11% of the U.S. population live under the po poverty line and families average about two kids per household. It also costs anywhere from, this, this shocked me, 22 to 
dollars per week to feed one child, depending on the age of the child and the level of the family spending. That means that about $21,000 to $77,000 later, you finally feed a child mm -hmm. until they're 18. So with that in mind, it is so expensive to feed a family. Can you talk about the cost barrier to healthy family eating behaviors? Absolutely. And I think that this kind of goes back to priorities and planning. Um, if you go to the grocery store with no plan in mind, it can be very overwhelming. So you're just grabbing what you think. And I know personally, I do this. If I don't have a plan or a list, I'm like, oh, I think I need that. I think I need that. So then you end up spending more money. Mm -hmm. So number one, make that plan. Um, and then also finding things that are cost effective and efficient. You know, um, I have this grand idea that I've thought about. My husband and I've talked about before that, um, when you have SNAP benefits or you have your EBT card or you have WIC benefits, there should be recipes and guides and things that you can follow and like, okay, you can buy a whole chicken and with the whole chicken, you can eat the rotisserie chicken and then you can make a soup and then you can do this and this and then you have broth and, you know, but we don't do that. Our, our government isn't there yet where we say this is all the steps that you can use to make all these resources go further. Mm -hmm. You know, you can eat healthy within a budget. You can buy a bag of rice for about a dollar, a bag of beans. Yeah, it takes a little bit more time, effort, planning, like we talked about, to soak those beans. But then you have, with rice and beans, you have a complete protein. Mm -hmm. um, so you have a meal that, you know, maybe you don't have all the vegetables in it, but you're if you're on a budget and you're hungry, that's going to feed you, that's going to keep you full, and it's going to be nutritionally complete in, in the protein in the protein family. Um, one of the things I like to make that my, I actually just made it last night, funny enough, is, and I had talked about it earlier, was dirty rice. So you use ground beef or ground turkey, um, peppers, onions, and some rice. Really, really cheap to make, makes a ton. And that's another thing is spreading those things out. Um, you know, putting a pound of beef or a pound of ground beef in with potatoes and onions and vegetables and grains that you can spread that out to make it more, more food for more people. Um, yeah. So that can be, that can be something. And, you know, you talk about fast food, but fast food is expensive these days. Like you can get the dollar menu and things, but if you get just like a meal at McDonald's, you can be $15 in before you know it. You know, so I think so much of the barrier of cost comes down to budgeting, which again comes down to planning and time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it's priorities too, because we tend to place our budget in places that aren't the best. But yeah. what, I, what I, what I like what you said too, especially that list of foods with the meal that you said, is that even if cost is your barrier, Many of those ingredients you can find at a corner store or like a gas station for that matter, like a bag of rice, a can of beans, something like that. So there are ways, but it just, it just requires education and exposure to it. And I guess the desire to want to eat better for your family, uh, even if you are in those situations, like in an inner city and your only store is the one on the corner and, um, you just need to know what to pick and how to make that last for your children. And even in, I know you mentioned that fast food places can be expensive, but there are options that are relatively cost effective that are also healthy in a fast food setting if you're limited with time, if time is your barrier and if cost is your barrier. So it's just a matter of picking the healthiest options, but then it also goes back, it all works together. And then it also goes back to exposure because you'll have a problem if your kids aren't exposed to the healthier options, say grilled chicken compared to fretted, fretted fried chicken. Mm -hmm. So it definitely all strings together. But speaking of the kids and not liking the taste of foods, kids not liking the taste of healthy foods or finding them completely boring, which is a huge barrier, mm -hmm. is a significant barrier. When I think about this barrier, I think about how many families are limited by financial resources and knowledge and ac access to foods that prevent them from buying healthy foods. And because they don't buy these healthy foods, their children never get exposed to things like asparagus and ground turkey and cottage cheese. Can you talk about the not liking the taste of healthy foods or finding them boring barrier? And more, do parents' palate 
affect the child's? Well, we had already discussed the fact that yes, uh, the parent's palate affects the child. And I talk about this so much when I, when I do counseling and nutrition assessments with people, it's who's buying the food. Usually it's mom and dad. So if mom and dad are buying healthy foods, the kids are exposed to healthy foods. Mm -hmm. You know, don't get me wrong. We do not always eat hundred percent healthy in our house, but I try, you know, we, we make a conscious effort to have fruits and vegetables. And we talk about that and we say, you know, okay, well, we're going to try this. You don't have to eat everything, but you're going to try it. And not like a tiny, tiny little <laughs> nibble on your fork. Like you have to like try the food. Um, but I think with that comes, you know, what you were just saying about, if mom and dad aren't eating it, the kids aren't going to eat it. So, so mom and dad might have to expose them themselves to it as well. And maybe make it a game, maybe make it a challenge. Every week you try something new, um, try a star fruit, try something like pick something out in the grocery store, which is another way to get your kids involved is to let them have some autonomy of, Hey, we're going to get this. We're going to try it, but we're going to try it. So yeah, it looks really cool, you know, and maybe let them pick something that's the not as healthy option sometime, because then it gives them that, that feeling of contributing to, to the family dynamic and the family system as a whole. Um, uh, get like vegetables and fruits and trying to get people to try new things. One of the things I listened to this really funny podcast, um, it's called Mom Truths. They're from Canada. They're uh -huh. his hysterical. I love them. And they say inappropriate things way too often, but they crack me up. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they were talking about is don't just give your kid a plate of raw broccoli and be like, good luck. You know, if you know that getting them to eat broccoli, they have to have ranch, let them eat ranch. And if this happens in my house all the time that usually the condiments outweigh whatever we're eating, like 20 to one. And instead of one piece of broccoli, it's like one piece of broccoli and three bowls of ranch. You have to have the Chick-fil-A dipping sauce. Come on. Right, right. But you know, maybe <laughs> if, this is what I try to do. It's okay. Well, this is how much ranch you get. So use it wisely. If you want to use it on one piece of broccoli, good, you know, um, and you can't just go from all of it to none of it. You have to taper down just like anything. If somebody's been drinking 10 Cokes a day, you're not just gonna say, sorry, no Cokes ever again. It's all right, we're gonna, we're gonna wean you down. We're going to make small changes um, because we don't ever wanna set anybody up for failure. We want to give them the tools to succeed. So yeah. that's another thing is if your kid doesn't like raw broccoli, okay, let's try cooked broccoli. If you have to put some cheese on that broccoli, put cheese on broccoli. Mm. If you try to add some butter, I mean, I don't want to just eat steamed broccoli. I want some butter on it and some salt <laughs> and some pepper and some garlic and some cavenders. And I want it to taste good. You know, we want our food to taste good. Yeah. So maybe finding some of those other alternative ways to help them palate what, what they're eating. You know, if they don't like I don't know if they don't like just plain bananas. How about a banana with peanut butter? Can they eat, um, will they eat maybe some celery with some pimento cheese on it or something, you know, and you, and you have to make some concessions, I think, as a parent. And sometimes that's hard, especially when, you know, we go back to that, well, I know best um, because we don't, you know, it, it's food that's going into their body and we have to be mindful of that just uh, just like we wouldn't want to eat something if we absolutely don't like it. You know, so I think coming back to that trying things and making it a sort of a, a game or a way that everybody feels heard and valued in the family. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, you said so many things that I would love to touch on. You, you said multiple times that sort of like if the, if you don't expect yourself to like it, like raw broccoli, how do you expect your child to like it? So it is, it's just finding what works for the kid. Um, but the, the biggest thing that I like that you said that I would love to touch on is maybe you do invite the unhealthy version of the food in. And I wanted to tie it back. Cause the first thing that I thought of is in my book, a lot of the practical applications that we do, we do taste testing, like blind taste testing. So we do the healthy version of food versus an unhealthy version of the food. And the, the one example is the classic, and I'm sure you've done it. And you do like a box brownie mix or a box cake mix, and you make it the way the box says versus you make it with applesauce instead of the oil. 
And then you don't let the kid know which one is which and you let them taste it and they can guess what they think is which. And they can also be like, when they figure out which is which, I still like the one that's a healthier option. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a great idea for any type of food, any food group. And like you were saying, if you have to put cheese on the broccoli, do that. Let them taste the one with the cheese on the broccoli, but also let them taste the steam one with just salt and pepper and see which they like better or if they can just tolerate the more healthy option. And it's a <laughs> great way for kids to have autonomy in their decision making, which ends up making them feel better. It's not just the parent saying, you're going to eat this because I said so. Right. It's You're going to try this. You're going to explore your palate and then we'll work from here as mm -hmm. a family. So I love that you said all that stuff. And I will go ahead and do the disclaimer. It's easier said than done. You know, sometimes it's great to talk about all this, but when you're at the dinner table, it, it can be difficult. So I always want to tell people, you know, don't worry about the Pinterest moms and the, the Facebook and the TikTok moms and all of the stuff out there that their kid is perfect and they eat healthy and they never have meltdowns and mm. nothing like that ever happens at there. And there's not fights at the dinner table because that's <laughs> not real life. I promise no. you, you know, um, I feel like if there's not a fight at our dinner table, at least once during the meal, like we're probably not all there, you know, <laughs> um, just because we're real, we're a real family and that stuff happens, you know? So, and I think that that's where people get so wrapped up in eating healthy and nutrition and exercise and lifestyle is it's not all or nothing. It's not black and white. It's not perfection and failure. It's meeting somewhere in the middle and finding what works for you, what works for your family, mm -hmm. how you guys deal with it, you know? Um, and I think that that's a big takeaway when we talk about this stuff is it's not just a hundred percent or nothing. It's what works for you guys. Yeah. And course correcting along the way. I love what you said about the Pinterest moms because no, and we, we do just like any other thing we have, what we, what we see is the standard and it's not the standard. I mean, you have to take your family for what your family is. And like I said, course correct along the way. Mm -hmm. So coming back to the child palate, I also hear there is a proper order of introduction of solid foods to children. For instance, if you introduce fruits before vegetables, the child will grow to like the taste of sweet foods better than things like vegetables that may have more of a bland taste and will be less likely to enjoy vegetables if that's the case. So this in turn could affect the number of other variables that could prevent the child from eating healthy foods that they would consider unappealing. Can you talk about the proper introduction of foods to children a little bit? Yeah, and I wanted to make a disclaimer that, you know, this is from my personal standpoint. I am not an expert in children nutrition, um, but I did a little bit of research, you know, and obviously introducing foods to the level of your child. So not introducing solid foods until they are able to sit, they show an interest, um, they've mastered the swallowing and suckling techniques, and then also just really looking at your own child, you know, there's, there's people that do baby led weaning, which is they start giving their children foods that are solid foods and not purees, you know, and it, if it works for them, it works for them. So again, it's kind of like the idea of breast is best. Is it like fed is best. So if, if feeding, if one thing works for you guys, then it works for you guys. You know, they do say introducing foods individually is best because then you can make sure that you check for allergens, especially if you have other um, family members that possibly have allergies, such as a milk allergy, a nut allergy, things like that. You know, if you can't get your kid to eat straight vegetables, do the purees that have bananas and kale mixture. We did that a lot with Stone, you know. Um, he wasn't a big fan of pears when he was little. Like that was one of the first fruits we introduced. Didn't like them. He, he'll eat them now. You know, so just trying things differently. Um, again, textures. Some kids don't like mushy food. Some kids don't like super crunchy food. So just monitoring that. Um, yeah. You know, obviously don't give somebody or a child, something that they would choke on, you know, hot dogs, grapes, never give honey to a child because of the risk factor of botulism, things like that. But other than, than those big, big rules that, you know, the USDA shows us and the American Pediatric Association shows us, it's kind of up to 
the parent, you know, the child, how does it work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The the one thing that I pulled out of that, that I was shocked and it, and it goes back to the education piece. You said honey because of botulism. And I was like, why wouldn't you give a baby honey? And I'm sitting here because I'm not educated on it, but we sort of expect that other women are right. It it just reminded me that education is so important and it's an initiative on the, on the behalf of the parent to become educated in those things. Because if I had a baby right next to me, I wouldn't know that they weren't able (laughs) to eat honey, but yeah, education is just so important. Um, but we, we did a little bit before talk about mirroring. And I think that's one of the most important things in the family unit. And I wanted to talk about a little bit more here and see what you, what else you have to say, because I remember growing up with my dad, it was a single family household and he wasn't a big guy necessarily, but he could eat like crazy. He would pile his, his plate full with spaghetti and all the sauce and all the meat and would down it. And so I picked up those behaviors. And in addition to seeing my dad eat that way, I was also part of the clean your plate club. So my mom, if we didn't finish our plate or my dad, if we didn't finish our plate, we had to eat the number of spoonfuls of our age. So she would ask us our age and we would say, yeah, I'm nine. So we have to eat nine spoonfuls before we could leave the table. And so that mirroring behavior of my dad combined with those rules created this environment and my eating behaviors as as they are today. So can you talk a little bit on mirroring in terms of family eating behaviors? Absolutely. Um, You know, one of the things like we talked about earlier, our children and those around us are going to mirror what they see, especially from a, a young age. You know, if you have small children, showing them that, okay, when we eat, we eat a vegetable, we eat a protein, we eat a starch. So I grew up in a house where my dad's side of the family were just good old salt of the earth, like farm families, you know, eggs, bacon, like meat and potatoes. My mother, her um, father was a diabetic. He was diagnosed at four. So it was like three years after they developed insulin. Um, So what they would call a brittle diabetic. So she grew up in a diabetic household where if you had potatoes at your meal, you didn't have bread. Like you had a carb um, or a starch, a vegetable and a protein. Their dessert usually was like fruit with cottage cheese, something like that. So she modeled that when she cooked, you know? So on Thanksgiving where you could have bread and stuffing and potatoes, everyone was like, whoa, this is so crazy. Um, so, you know, modeling and mirroring what we saw. And that's that's a lot how we eat is, okay, well, we have to make choices. You know, if you want, like, let's say we're having something where maybe we're having leftovers and there was a little bit of this and a little bit of this. Okay, if you choose rice for your starch, we're not going to have French fries too. Like we're going to pick one. You can pick, but we're going to pick one. Um, and then portion control, like you just said, it's if, if you can pile on as much food as you want, and this comes back to behavior that we'll talk about next time. If you give the kid the opportunity to put the food on their plate and they put that much food, they're going to start to realize, okay, I can't eat that much. Mm. But as a parent, if you're putting a portion size And we have to consider that portion sizes can be different for age groups. You know, um, a standard portion might not be the right amount for somebody that's three versus, uh, you know, an 18 year old boy that's playing football and basketball and baseball and, you know, running around and I mean, lifting and just can eat whatever. Mm -hmm. So, So knowing those things as well. And then also being able to identify intuitive eating. Am I really hungry? okay, am I still hungry? So we sort of have this rule in our house. I usually end up fixing plates for the family just because it's easier to get all the kids, you know, settled and everything. But we eat our food and I know that my daughter is going to eat less than my 10 year old son. So her portions are smaller. So she still does have to eat that or try that or whatever, but it's going to look different than Tyler's portions or my portion or whatnot. You know, I usually have more vegetables on my plate than the rest of them. Um, but one of the things that we talk about is eating our food. And then especially if we're hungry or we want seconds, waiting, letting our body say, okay, are we still hungry? Are we just, it tasted so good. We just want to keep eating. So I think kind of going back to what you were saying is not only the mirroring and the modeling, but the behavior of, okay, am I just eating to eat or am I really hungry? You know, and identifying those feelings and those emotions that go with those feelings. Um, I, my mother, 
was forced when they were little to clean their plates. So growing up, my sister and I, we were not forced to clean our plates. We had to try everything. And like I said, trying is not one bite or <laughs> one tiny little morsel of rice. It's trying it a couple of times, you know, eating some of it. And I think that that's a good rule of thumb is to encourage trying different foods, but not necessarily encouraging cleaning their plate. And then starting to let kids create their own plate and pick the foods that, that you have to put this much food, you know, or these many things on your plate, but letting them say, okay, well, this looks like a portion size of carrots and looking at what a true portion size is maybe versus what they chose. And this can go two ways. It can be either way too much or way too little, you know, and looking at what that really looks like, because in our society, we are very bad about overeating, hmm. you know, and not recognizing what a portion size looks like. You know, you go out and you get a steak and you're like, oh, that's, that's a huge steak. That's like six portions, like, <laughs> and, you know, ounces of meat, but you're like, oh, I could eat that. So when you see like what a portion size, that looks like a deck of cards is, you're like, oh, wow, that's, that's it. Yeah. So just kind of, you know, remembering those things and educating ourselves. And I guess it's not only mirroring, like I said, but modeling, and then also just, you know, working, I guess, together to, to make it work again, what's right for you guys. Yeah. And I, I love what you said about, um, modeling. It, it made me think of the Bible because in several, on several occasions in the Bible, they talk about the parent leading the household or the father leading the household. And it is so important that you're this strong wall of support knowledge and just a wealth of knowledge for, for your children to be able to effectively lead them through. So it is, it's mirroring where they're actually seeing you do it and they're doing it, but it's also education and, and modeling or um, teaching, like teaching them how to do it too. And the teaching part is really important too. And you, you talked about portion sizes and the thing that I love to use and I talk about in my book too, is the, the hand, the hand can be used for any portion size because it's relative to the size of the individual. So you, for instance, two fists are what you're going to eat for vegetables for most meals. And my two fists are huge and they look much different than my little two-year-old niece and her two fists. And so we, we talk about that ad nauseum in my book, but it is such a good tool and anybody can learn it at any age. And then, like you said, you can give them the, the autonomy, the self-awareness to be able to put those foods on their plate themselves. So they get a chance to see what it actually looks like. So that was, that was really good. Now this next one is, um, <laughs> I love this one because I think about my family. Um, what about the barrier of the grandparent or other family members giving the children anything they want for nutrition. I hear this all the time. What can you tell me about this barrier? Oh, wow. Um, grandparents, mother-in-laws, father-in-laws. Um, you know, I'm very lucky that we in our family dynamic, we don't really have to deal with that, but I know so many people do. Um, you know, uh, my, I remember when my sister first had her first child, um, they're very, they're very strict with what their kids eat. And Lucas had never had fried food, never had like sugar. And he came to Oklahoma and we went to this place. I'm not kidding you. It was called Pig Out Palace. Uh -huh. We were there for at like an Easter dinner and there was fried catfish. So Lucas had fried catfish and French fries. And then there was ice cream. He had ice cream, got sick, threw up everywhere. It was, you know, Poor little kid had never had any of it, but it was my dad was like, oh, he's fine. He can eat it. He can eat it. And my sister's like, dad, he's never, ever eaten stuff like that. Like, I promise you, it's not going to, it's not going to work out well. Um, but again, you know, my dad, he's like, oh, it's fine. You know, he'll be fine. So that I remember seeing that, um, it's tough. It's, it's difficult. You know, it's sort of that you can do whatever you want with grandma. And I think that that comes back to family dynamics and confidence in yourself and your spouse, if you have a spouse or your partner, or if it's your, just you as a single person, um, the rules for your family, like what are your individual goals and guidelines for your family, you know? And of course kids are going to get away with stuff when they're at grandma and grandpa's because they're like, just don't tell your mom that we had, you know, three ice cream cones. Um, so I think it's, it's about respect 
you know, it comes down to having that conversation. And sometimes those are hard conversations to have, especially when you have a child or a family member that you have to worry about their weight or health issues or things like that. Um, it's, it's thinking about what is important for that individual. You know, if you have an individual that you know really should not be indulging because of, I mean, for instance, Tyler, my son, is non-ambulatory. So he cannot eat the same amount of calories that somebody that can run around and play 10 hours a day can eat. You know, so we have to think about that of smart choices. You know, yeah, you can have a cupcake, but you can't have four cupcakes, you mm -hmm. know, things like that. So, so just being in an open, respectful relationship where you can maybe have that conversation. And believe me, it's hard. It's hard to have tough conversations with people. It is. Um, it is. And we're, we're going to be talking about that. And the, the next time we talk about how to address that and sort of create your, your own limits mm -hmm. and those conversations with those type of people. And what, what you were talking about made me think, because you, you talked about before, um, your child and their dietary habits being influenced too by their friends. Mm -hmm. So that's a really hard, even, even more difficult than the family, because it's not like you can necessarily talk to a teenager, another teenager about that. So it's like, I can't talk to your child about this, but you have to be able to set those, those um, limits with your own child and educate your own child to make better behavior choices. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that that's one of the things it's, control you know you can't control things it's I had somebody tell me once you know that control was something by an egotistical maniac because control really doesn't exist and if you think you can control things you can't you know yeah. so um you just have to like anything give your children and your family members the tools to do the best they can when you're not around like that's what we're ultimately doing when we raise children we give them the tools we teach them what we know learn from our mistakes we're going to try to make you the best human we can for when you go out in the world and you do it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's kind of it with nutrition is at home, hopefully they've gained the skills that when they go out, maybe they know that when they eat three pieces of pizza, they don't feel very good. So maybe they only eat two pieces of pizza, or maybe they realize that when they've eaten a bunch of junk, they don't feel very good the next day. So just giving them the tools and you know, one of the things that, that we deal with in our family is when you come over to our house, you're going to eat like we eat. You know, we don't eat ice cream before we eat dinner. Mm -hmm. I, it might be like that at your house and that's fine, you know, but at our house we eat dinner and we sit down together and we actually, you know, like talk and it, that's the way we do it. So when it, when at our house, that's what we do, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now these times are tough with COVID uh -huh. and it, it is so hard. And, and in fact, um, right now I'm in the Philadelphia area with my family and it's different in this area compared to where we are in Arkansas. Like for instance, the gyms are shut down here. Like I had to do a workout in my sister's living room this morning and it is so different across the globe with what you have access to, what things are closed. And I can imagine nutrition is so difficult in this time with finances and with all those things. So can you talk about any COVID related barriers that you think are, are huge to consider during this time in relation to nutrition and family dynamics of eating? Absolutely. I think one of the big ones is finances. Like you mentioned, um, with this time and, and with this pandemic, people have lost their jobs. People are working different hours. They're, it looks different for everybody. So that can be a huge problem. And then also, um, time, you know, uh, schedules look different for people. I know a lot of times we've talked about we're working from home versus working from the office. If you have kids that are at home um, during the day, that looks different, you know, trying to think about more meals during the week, things like that, which the school systems have done a great job of providing meals and resources for kids that are doing virtual learning or things like that. Um, other things related to COVID are just the ability to access food and to get food, you know, where you can't go just, um, you know, we're, we're a little different where we're not as restrictive as some other places where we haven't really had a true lockdown or anything like that, which that's a whole other story, you know, but you're still able to go to the grocery store, but those that aren't able, you know, utilizing some of those services such as the Walmart to go or the Kroger delivery, things like that has, have been helpful, but that's a big challenge, you know, especially when those services do cost extra money sometimes, you know, um, 
Also, just some of the things such as just the access to different foods. With, um, with this pandemic, some things that have been normally available haven't been as available. You know, staples. When this first thing started, you know, it wasn't just the toilet paper that we were short of. It was, you were see people, you would see people hoard and stock, you know, so you couldn't go to and just buy a loaf of bread and milk and, you know, some of those staples, even some of the vegetables that you wouldn't think people would be buying, they were buying. So, so just kind of those sort of things. So some of the things we'll talk about, you know, next time are solutions. So, you know, looking at different ways to get intakes of fruits and vegetables, canned, frozen, things like that, where if you don't have that access yeah. Yeah. And I am so excited. So I think we just got done addressing the top barriers that Ken Dan and I could come up with to prevent healthy eating behaviors in the family unit. And I am even more excited to talk about some of the practical applications to addressing some of those barriers, because we tend to think that this is a barrier and this is what I'm assigned with. And I have no way of getting over it, but there is always a way no matter how much money you have, no matter how little time you have, no matter the worldwide epidemic that's going on, there is a way to eat well for your family um, and meet your family where they are. And so I am so excited to talk about that next time. Can Dan, it was a pleasure as always. And with that, we're going to sign off here. All right. Thank you so much.